Hi. Can everyone hear me okay? Cool. Um, well, it's been a great week, and um, this is such an honor for me to be here at Build. Thanks so much to Andy uh, for having me here. Um, and I also wanted to start by saying thank you, since I think you might be in the room, to Ethan Market uh, for leading the charge on responsive web design. There are a lot of things that come along that really change the game for how you think about what you do. But for me, responsive web design was one of those things. Before I started working on the web, I worked as a print designer. And if you're designing a book, there's only one page size, and then everything comes from that. So you spec the type, you design the baseline grid, you shape the page, and then the format, in a way, forms the design. A responsive design for the web, however, is shaped by its context. It adapts to how you're viewing it. Rather than assume a fixed form, it embraces fluidity. It uses one code base to solve many different situations, and it does this elegantly, even beautifully. The practice of web design is shaped by its context as well. While it exists as an invention, it also exists as a critique. It critiques fixed grid layouts, for example, since they can't scale responsively. In fact, it critiques fixed presentation methods of all sorts. Instead of seeking a lowest common denominator for a site's presentation, or fragmenting it across several subdomains, responsive web design says that you can have it all. Presentation needn't be singular, and fragmentation needn't be necessary. A site's design can be both variable and total. This is a really big deal. It seems simple when Ethan describes it, but it's a fundamental shift in thinking about how things for the web are made. Ethan's piece on a list apart started with a quote from John Alsop's The Tao of Web Design about ebb and flow. In that article, Alsop describes a number of Taoist teaching, and he transforms them into guiding principles for the web. Emptiness is not on Alsop's list, but he might have included it. Here's what the Tao says about emptiness. We pierce doors and windows to make a house. And it is on these spaces where there is nothing that the usefulness of the house depends. Therefore, just as we take advantage of what is, we should recognize the usefulness of what is not. A house is the space it contains and the space it releases. Its windows frame space through absence. A house interacts with its environment through portions that are either removed or never built. As much as a house is defined by its building, the Tao says, it's also defined by its unbuilding. This is a talk about unbuilding. When we think about building, we think about a lot of things. For example, we think about what we can build, and that takes knowledge. So building is about learning, building skills, building with those skills. And in order to learn, we have to take the world apart a bit, unravel it, examine it up close. In other words, we have to unbuild it. To build anything revolutionary, we've got to be innovative. We've got to invent new strategies, new approaches, new tools. So building is about inventing, making new, even surprising our competition. But in order to invent, we also have to shake things up, disrupt our normal process, reorganize. Again, unbuilding. And building is undoubtedly about growth, making something bigger. Maybe scaling a little bit, maybe scaling a lot, but bringing things up to the next level. And doing that involves, you guessed it, unbuilding disseminating your point of view, dispensing your product, diversifying your capital, all that. So learning and unraveling, inventing and disrupting, scaling and disseminating, you can't have one without the other. If building is the call, unbuilding is the response. They're two sides of the same coin, each constituting the other. Far from the opposite of building, unbuilding offers us an opportunity to see what it means to build from a fresh perspective. Let's start by giving a little more depth to these concepts. Here's building on the left and unbuilding on the right. While building is planned and we follow a step-by-step -step path, unbuilding is reflexive. At last year's build, Wilson Miner reminded us of the Marshall McLuhan quote, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. That's a reflexive thought. It works in a circular way. Building looks forward to prog with progress while unbuilding evaluates and learns by looking back. Building involves skills and know-how, Unbuilding requires inquiry and investigation. When we build, we follow patterns. When we unbuild, we often find them. Building involves setting expectations, while the objective of unbuilding is often discovery. In, the, in building, we place things where they're supposed to go. In unbuilding, we often try to misplace or creatively recombine them. When we build, we build with intention. When we unbuild, we embrace chance. And because building is a logical process, the element of unbuilding has this element of surprise and wonder, and it can often be an emotional process. Earlier I said that while responsive web design functioned as a practice, it also functioned as a critique of the practices that came before it and the culture that surrounded it. 
Art often functions this way too, and I want to take a look at some artworks today and see how we might learn from how they work. This is Marcel Duchamp's bicycle wheel from 1913. Like Ethan's idea of responsive web design, Duchamp's bicycle wheel hugely influenced the art that came after it. It's widely regarded as Duchamp's first ready-made, kicking off almost a century of appropriation in the art world. But like responsive web design, the bicycle wheel is also a critique of the culture that surrounded it, especially the culture of cycling and of mass production, which by 1913 was more than a century old. So it's reasonable to stop and ask at this point, how did Duchamp create this totally new approach to art? What strategies is he using here? If we were seeking this kind of insightfulness in our work, how might we systematically approach it? We've already talked about appropriation. He's clearly doing that. He's unbuilding our concept of what's original. Duchamp, Duchamp also reflexively said that instead of choosing his objects, his objects chose him. So this injects a bit of chance into the imperative of artistic choice. I've also talked a little bit about how the bicycle wheel negates the conditions that surrounded it, about bicycles and about art making. And it does so through a kind of removal of the artist himself. And we have an expectation about the role of the artist. So in a way, this work seems incomplete. Even its author can't quite describe what it means. And this failure, failure to be meaningful in a, in a comfortable way, to even qualify as something we understand as typically art, this is built into the bicycle wheel's efforts at unbuilding its context. So I've named a few strategies, and to these we could add a few more. Strategies like speculation. What will things look like in the future? Or repetition. What do 100 of these things mean? What about a million? Or comedy. What, what does it mean if I laugh at this? The Daily Show lets us laugh at the news. So there's an example of that. But I want to look, you know, as we look at all these strategies that come out of unbuilding, I want to zoom in on four of them today. Negation, removal, reversal, and incompleteness, and see how they function with examples in art, the web, and elsewhere. A little disclaimer, some of these uh, strategies are very complementary. A particular reversal might also be a negation of some kind, for example. My goal here isn't to create rigid categories. I want to spark new ideas about how we work. So let's start with negation and with the Canadian artist Jeff Wall. This is an incredible image by Jeff Wall, stunning and complex. It's called, simply enough, Tattoos and Shadows. In an interview with SF MoMA, Wall describes his process using this image as an example. He says, I begin by not photographing. So if he's out on the street and he sees something like this that strikes him, he simply doesn't photograph it. Instead, he memorizes the scene. This image was made a year after Wall first saw it in real life. There's a different tree, fewer people, different people. But in his recreation, Wall enhanced what's so powerful about this image, the, the temporary pattern of light laid on top of the permanent inked patterns on the subject's skin. Here it is in installation. So you can see it doesn't look like a typical photograph. So let's look again at how this image exists as a critique, how it unmakes the world of photographs, and particularly the photographs like everyday snapshots that are most typical in the world. Here's two lists that work like readings on a set of dials. I've already described how this work is recreated, remembered, and translated from life with Wall's enhancements. As an art object, it's also a light box, not a print, so it's literally made of light. It's large scale, and Wall doesn't addition them, so each light box is individual and original. And there's something controlled and knowing about the image that comes from Wall's subjectivity and the year he spent thinking about it. It's self-aware and self-conscious, yet its material has to be drawn from life. Negation also works on the web. You might be thinking of some ways already. This is an interesting project done last year by the artists Joan Jonas and Anke Schwarzloser called This Too Shall Pass. This work was included in a group exhibition about photography and performance called The Second Act. A photographic print has been placed on a shelf attached to a shredder. When someone visits the website for the project, the shredder is activated for a third of a second. After enough visits, the entire edition is destroyed. Wall's type of negation is non-action. Lund and Schwarzloh's type of negation is non-preservation. Unlike Wall, they present their work as an addition, not an individual work. But they also display that addition in a way that destroys it. And more importantly, they make a normally passive audience consider the meaning of looking at something. The internet places us in an economy of attention. And here, that attention is heightened, even quantified, until the addition is gone. This too shall pass unbuilds our feeling about experiencing art in a mediated way. Negation can also function in interactive and participatory situations beyond the web. Let's look at unbuilding a working process. I'm a thesis advisor, as Andy mentioned, in the grad program for graphic design at the Rhode Island School of Design. And last year, I led a three-week workshop called Antithesis. So negation was clearly on my mind. 
The class came at a critical point in the year, in January, between semesters. Thesis topics weren't exactly new for my students anymore, and there was a long slog ahead in the spring. Fatigue, anxiety, maybe even a bit of discouragement were all starting to set in. Clearly, it was time to twist some dials. Unlike the thesis, antithesis was an optional class. Instead of a constant year-long process, it was interstitial, happening in the downtime between semesters. We didn't really have class meetings. Instead, I spent my time just hanging out in the studio, and everyone loosened up. After thinking intensively about the thesis for 12 weeks, it was time to stop thinking about it, at least consciously. The goal was not to keep pushing forward on the, on the thesis, but to get new projects started in parallel. Part of shaking things up was offering some new prompts. So instead of honing research essays, we made tote bags. Tote bags have been everywhere recently, gaining significance as a social signaling device, particularly Anya Hindemarch's I'm not a plastic bag, which is negation again. But we also looked at ways of mixing scholarly research in time and space. We looked at the supercut as a way of mixing found video, and this one's for Andy and Kirby. We also looked at tabletops and things arranged neatly as ways of spatially organizing source materials and objects of design. And here are some of those. And we finished our time together by making a website of our work. And it was only a few weeks, uh, only online a few weeks, when one project, a tabletop exploration that came out of thesis research around the aesthetics of the novel, showed up on Huffington Post and ping-ponged around the web from there. Soon after that, a supercut called Cage Does Cage, showing four minutes and 33 seconds of silent looks from various Nicolas Cage films, showed up on BuzzFeed. My students were never expecting this kind of response to their work. When you're in the middle of something complex and lengthy, like a thesis project, you often know a lot more than you think. My students thought they were struggling, yet their ideas proved to be tremendously resonant, not just to the design community, but to the culture at large. They were doing a lot better than they thought. They just needed to change their process. They needed to get out of a standard educational process that puts one thing after another and get into a looser, more associative process that let them use what they already knew to ask new questions. There's a very smart curator named Charles Escher, who's a director of the Van Abba Museum in Holland. And he wrote an article that went back and looked at the history of avant-garde art programs, along with documents about how artists should be educated. And there were a lot of disagreements in these documents, as you'd expect, but he found three common threads. The first is anti-specialization, which basically says sculptors can do things other than sculpt and painters can do things other than paint. The second was what he called anti-isolation or anti-autonomy. And that means that basically art should matter. It should get out of the museum and touch the world in specific ways. And the third one was anti-hierarchy. Basically that making art shouldn't be, should be available to everyone, not just to a certain class of people. So negations in all of these, that's where these disparate approaches to art education find common ground decade after decade. And every one of these ideas has been applied to the web. When you think about anti-specialization, think about hackers and painters. When you think about anti-autonomy, think about doing things that matter. And when you think about anti-hierarchy, think about the value of passion projects, startups, and all the amazingly talented amateurs online. The next strategy, strategy of removal, also connects to Esha's threads. These threads don't just negate the conditions of art education, they also seek to remove the structures underlying those conditions. In order for anti-hierarchy to be a rallying cry, hierarchies must first exist, and then they have to be removed. So negation and removal are related. And I was thinking about this as I went into a workshop in Italy this September at the Free University of Bolzen Bolzano. The workshop was part of a symposium on design education, and like antithesis, the idea for this workshop was really simple. Instead of supplying a syllabus, I removed it. And instead of hiding that fact, I drew my students' attention to it, asking them to write one of their own. My model for this was Maria Montessori, who described herself as an anti-teacher, more of a careful observer or guide in the classroom than a professor or an instructor. And what resulted over the next two days was a wide-ranging discussion about methods and models of education, educational debt, administrative hurdles to interdisciplinarity, and realizing the utopian dream of the open school. Within hours, one group had posted a syllabus for open source learning on GitHub, and had started to discuss it via Git commits. Another group went out to film international students discussing the impact of the Bologna Declaration, which calls for educational compatibility in Europe on their everyday lives. And online, removal works as a strategy just as well. This gallery of internet sprites by the OK Focus uh, artist and OK Focus co-founder Ryder Rips takes the sheets of tiny image sprites used by services like Twitter and Gmail and archives them. The sprite sheets, as you know, were created to speed up sites by reducing calls to the server for small images, but in removing them from their original context, RIPS presents the sprites in an original way. 
These tiny images organize and spatialize the way we interact with these powerful platforms, what they allow, what they encourage, the color and shape of selection and refusal, all of these things are contained within these tiny images. Rips's work has found a huge audience online, and it's this unbuilding process that I think gives it much of its force. Here's an Irish example. Dan Walsh, an IT manager from Dublin, started the popular site Garfield minus Garfield, which many of you may know, in 2008 after being captivated by discussions of how the strip might be different if its title character was removed. It quickly became a phenomenon. Four months after it launched, Walsh was getting 30,000 hits a day. Without Garfield's witty thought balloons, his owner, John Arbuckle's deep pathos is revealed. <laughs> Questions about Garfield's creator, Jim Davis, that J Garfield's creator, Jim Davis, intended as setups uh, for the cat's punchlines instead serve to express the deep disaffection and existential uncertainty of everyday life. This is a different kind of humor for a different kind of time. And this generational tension exists in the art world, too. For example, in the now famous erased William de Kooning drawing by Robert Rauschenberg. After visiting de Kooning in his studio to introduce himself, Rauschenberg asked the elder abstract expressionist for a drawing to erase. De Kooning, unsure at first, eventually agreed, but only after selecting a drawing that he would truly miss, and one that would be very difficult for Rauschenberg to erase. The process took Rauschenberg two months and raises all sorts of questions. Who's the author of this piece? Is this a creative act or a destructive one? Has a work of art been lost or gained? These questions, of course, are impossible to resolve, such is the beauty of this piece. Rauschenberg's act makes meaning by turning loss into a material. The drawing was once about what had been created. Rauschenberg has converted that into something that's about what's been removed. Earlier this year, Wikipedia performed an act of self-removal in the face of concerns that the Stop Online Privacy Act and the Protect IP Act would do serious harm to free speech and free knowledge exchange online. For 24 hours from January 18th to 19th, the site went dark and invited everyone to consider a world without Wikipedia. It's hard to imagine a more powerful gesture. By January 24th, Senator Harry Reid and Representative Lamar Smith announced that the test vote on their bills would be postponed due to lack of support. With this legislative about face in mind, I want to look at the third strategy, which is, of course, <laughs> reversal. Wikipedia doesn't work without the technology of writing an illiterate public. Yet there was a long time in human history when literacy was the exception, not the rule. Culture spread through speaking and remembering, not writing and reading. And even though we may already know these facts, we often think about texts like Homer's Odyssey as a written text that we read silently to ourselves, not something that was designed to be easily memorized, spoken, and listened to. In his book, Orality and Literacy, Professor Walter Ong analyzes the transition and theorizes the impact of literacy on human consciousness. In describing the impossibility of understanding a culture that is primarily oral from the point of view of one that is primarily literate, he draws a comparison to the automobile. Quote, imagine writing a treatise on horses for people who've never seen a horse, which starts with the concept not of horse, but of automobile, built on readers' direct experience of automobiles. Instead of wheels, the wheelless automobiles have enlarged toenails called hooves. Instead of headlights, eyes. Instead of a coat of lacquer, something called hair. Instead of gasoline for fuel, hay, and so on. In the end, horses are only what they are not. So in a sense, Ong unbuilds the car to build a horse, and he reverses the relentlessly forward-moving arrow of time. He ends with a negation. To unbuild the car, to build a horse, is not to build a horse at all. Metaphors about technological progress often reference transportation like this. Think about Steve Jobs' bicycle for your mind, or Ted Nelson's recent suggestion at Brooklyn Beta that computers that simulate paper are like ripping the wings off a 747 and driving it down the highway as a, like a bus, which is an image that, once he's described it, is difficult to erase from your mind. These metaphors are so memorable because they place progress in reverse. And the illustrator David McCauley has done something similar in his book Unbuilding, whose title might be a namesake for this talk. For many years, Macaulay has drawn an incredible series of books that illustrate everything from pyramids to castles to subway systems and how they're built. But in Unbuilding, he describes a future in which the Empire State Building is disassembled brick by brick in order to be shipped across the ocean to a foreign buyer. Tragically, in the story, the ship is lost at sea. Why tell the story in this way? A clue might be in Macaulay's dedication to the book, quote, to those of us who don't always appreciate things until they're gone. 
What does a building mean to a city? What does a website mean to a society? What does a drawing mean to an artist? What does a character mean to a story? What does a photograph mean to a viewer? These questions are difficult to answer, and more often we don't even consider them. But again and again, unbuilding is a process that asks us to confront these questions about the hidden forces that shape our interactions with the world. Pointer Pointer does this too. Using a large database of candid snapshots of people pointing in different directions, it tracks the movements of your mouse so that when you point, people point back to you. This simple reversal makes you eerily aware of the movements of your own mouse while you're confronted with goofy photos of strangers you never asked to see. Pointer Pointer raises questions about all sorts of things, big data, click tracking, online surveillance, just to name a few. The personal website of Jake Dow Smith asks a similar set of questions. What does a personal website really seek to rep represent? Is it a place to post ideas, share photos, link to external projects? Should it give a sense of who someone really is? These days, we do so much of our living through email, but how much of that process are we really allowed to see? When we log onto his site, we seem to be looking at Dow Smith's desktop, complete with incoming mail. Is this real? Are we supposed to be seeing this? Dow Smith reverses what's closed and what's open on his site. Instead of portfolio materials, we get personal emails, grocery lists, even deleted spam. We're left asking what we'd hope to find and what a personal website is really capable of sharing. <coughs> Reversal can be immensely appealing, too. When I originally dreamed up this talk, the first image of unbuilding that came to mind was this routine by Penn & Teller, which dazzled me on TV when I was a kid. In this amazing sequence, they start with a pretty silly trick. As you can see, Teller enters a rocket ship, and parts of him blast off all over the stage until he's eventually recombined. It's a pretty literal image of unbuilding in that sense. But what's incredible is the reversal. I'll show you that in a minute. Let's speed this up. So here they are, transporting Teller. He's blasting off. So basically, in the second half of the trick, um, they, they bring a set of clear boxes out. And they show you how to do the trick a second time, but this time they reveal the secrets behind it. So here they are with the clear boxes. And what's amazing is that the audience clearly likes the first version. It's a great trick. But they really love the second version. What's so thrilling about this trick is <laughs> not the trick itself the second time around, but the process, the artistry, the craft of the trick. It's like David Ogilvy telling you how to write an ad. It really just makes you want to hire him to write one for you. And, I was, and something in this trick, seeing this trick after all these years, made me think of something I'd seen earlier this year. This incredible demonstration of the Kiva robot, which was shown by Kiva CEO Mick Mounts at TED Boston in June 2011. As you can see, the system literally unbuilds the warehouse. So instead of a worker going to the shelving, the shelving goes to the worker. And at the core of this reversal is a human benefit. Not only is this old method an inefficient way to fill orders, it's an unfulfilling way to fill orders. So in a single stroke, Kiva changes the warehouse's architecture from fixed to emergent. And the methods that it uses to choreograph the shelves on the floor are now parallel, not serial. Kiva was acquired by Amazon in March this year. Here's another reversal I saw last year, this time by the architectural firm Interborough Partners. Every summer, MoMA's PS1 invites a new young architecture firm to install a project in its courtyard. This installation offers shade, seating, and shelter during outdoor concerts that take place there during the summer. But while these concerts are well attended by New York's art and music scene, Interborough learned that many local residents at Long Island City had never even visited PS1. A high wall, which you can see in this image, around the courtyard only added more distance. So during the months leading up to the project, which Interborough called Holding Pattern, the architects surveyed the neighborhood, asking institutions what they needed. The taxi drivers wanted a ping pong table. The ballet school needed new mirrors. The senior center wanted benches. Interborough purchased or designed these items using the installation budget and held them in PS1's courtyard for the summer. 
their eventual recipients were invited to use them, give performances, host readings, and take part in the cultural life of the museum. Interboro writes, when Holding Pattern was deinstalled this past fall, we delivered 79 objects and 84 trees to more than 50 organizations in Long Island City. This is the best kind of reversal, of recycling, a social design process that works from the inside out. The last strategy I want to discuss, a bit more loosely, is incompleteness. What we might call, we might call something unbuilt if it's taken apart, but we might also consider something unbuilt if it's never finished. And so to embed incompleteness in a thing is to leave it unbuilt, and yet this is such a pervasive part of the web that it's hard to even single out a single example. What website isn't being tinkered with all the time, changed, added to, improved? Isn't incompleteness what makes websites dynamic, responsive, fluid, timely, adaptive, and all the rest? Of course it is. One of the best places to see incompleteness is in action is GitHub. This July, developer John G. Norman wrote a great post on his blog that described GitHub as the most important social network, and I'm inclined to agree with him. Certainly one of the most interesting to me. Norman explains how GitHub doesn't just provide a decentralized method for collaborating on computer code, it also makes available and analyzable the very nature of human-to-human -human collaboration. GitHub unbuilds the way things get done. It assumes code is by its very nature incomplete, and in the process, it gives us unbelievable access to the nature of work. Norman writes, yes, I know that conversations on Facebook and Twitter have their purposes, but at GitHub, there's a real pressure to move the project along and keep it alive. If you're a scholar interested in computer-mediated communication, you ignore GitHub at your peril. In February, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum took the very exciting step of releasing its collection's metadata on GitHub using Creative Commons Zero, the most permissive license available. In doing so, the museum's digital and emerging media director, Seb Chan, hoped that offering this information would make it more discoverable, allowing it to be searched from outside the museum's own website. Even more, he hoped that releasing the metadata would inspire new forms of interpretation around the collection. The collection's metadata is incomplete in two ways. For one thing, as Chan notes, it isn't really the objects themselves, only the information describing them. And for another thing, it's only as good as what you can do with it. Incomplete metadata is made more useful when it enables an item from the collection to appear in exhibitions, catalogs, and other experiences. Chan asks, could GitHub become not just a source code repository, but a repository for cultural source code? That's a great thought. Language is a more direct expression of cultural source code, and it's being edited, tweaked, and extended all the time, as Robin mentioned in his talk. Designer and illustrator Joe Davis's website, Telescopic Text, takes the simple sentence, I made tea, and unfolds these three words, clause by clause, into a total of almost 200. In so doing, a simple documentary fact becomes experiential and associative, and it's as pleasant to play with as it is to read, as world, words swirl around one another like milk in Davis's teacup. But much earlier, the writer Jorge Luis Borges described the same kind of incompleteness in a lecture at Harvard titled simply, The Metaphor. In it, Borges describes how metaphors arise before language, before we find words to describe something. Then, as we share these concepts with one another, metaphors evolve into words. Borges jokes that a word is a dead metaphor, which is a metaphor. <laughs> But then he returns to what metaphors can do and introduces the concept of openness, which is related to incompleteness. Metaphors are open because they're incomplete. They make a suggestion that we must complete in our own minds. Here's Borges. Remember what Emerson said, arguments convince nobody. They convince nobody because they're presented as arguments. We look at them, we weigh them, we turn them over, and we decide against them. But when something is merely said, or better still, hinted at, there's a hospitality in our imagination. We are ready to accept it. And this idea of incompleteness is embedded in our legal system, too. Laws have amendments, precedents, arguments are overruled. The law is constantly unbuilding and rebuilding itself. When Barack Obama ran for president in 2008, his iconic speech on race centered on a single phrase in the US Constitution, the idea of a more perfect union. With this idea of progressing toward perfectibility, the Constitution ensured its status as a living document, something that was, not, that was simply a first draft, born incomplete, made more perfect with each generation, but never truly perfectible. 
Okay, covered a lot today. I've described a way that making things can critique the world around us by unbuilding systems. I've described this kind of process as something that's not opposed to building, but something that catalyzes all knowledge, invention, and growth. And I've pointed to a few examples that we can use in our individual work. But what about our collective work? I've described how you can't build a house without unbuilding. But what about a community? Of course, unbuilding figures there too. And in our creative community on the web, I believe unbuilding, how we look back at what we've done, reflect on it, find patterns, make discoveries, embrace chance and emotion as pathways to meaning, unbuilding is a tremendously important part of making our community stronger, pushing us further, and most importantly, linking us to cultural conversations that are happening across disciplines. A few months ago at our studio, we met with a museum curator who was interested in bringing some of our work into her collection. And she looked at books, posters, identity manuals, exhibition diagrams, all these physical things that we'd made, and they all seemed pretty easy to acquire. But when we started to talk about websites, she grew quiet. As we talked, I discovered it wasn't just the technology that made matters difficult for her, but the lack of a canon. What websites have other museums acquired, she asked me. It's hard to start from zero. And at that moment, I realized that we needed to start building not just in a practical sense, but in a critical sense. Together, we need to think about building a canon for the web. This is a hard thing to do. Our discipline's relatively new. It encompasses a wide range of skills and talents. Its techniques are always changing. With the publication of the late Bill Moggridge's Designing Interactions in 2007, the discussion really seemed to get started. And soon after that, Armin Witt wrote an essay asking landmark websites, where art thou? And Koivin and many others promptly responded. It's tempting to say that we don't need a canon, but the curator who visited me, along with Bill and Armin and Koi and all the others, all have a point. Canons are the sign of a maturing discipline. They build consensus, they spark debates, they establish through lines and themes, and they set the parameters for future critiques to undo. Web design may be a participatory practice, a political practice, a commercial practice, but I also believe that web design must consider itself an aesthetic practice. This is, after all, why we're all here. And canons, problematic though they may be, have been the operating systems for aesthetic practices for a long time. Andrew Blauvelt, one of our foremost critics of design and a curator at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, published an essay in 2003 called Towards a Critical Autonomy, in which he wrote, graphic design must be seen as a discipline capable of generating, its own in generating meaning out of its own intrinsic resources without reliance on commissions, functions, or specific materials or means. Such actions should demonstrate a self-awareness and reflexivity, a capacity to manipulate the system of graphic design. So my question for you today is, can the same be true of web design? Is web design a system capable of unbuilding itself? I believe, and people like Ethan have shown us, that this is possible. What else is possible? When we think about what we'd like to build, let's think about building a canon, even if it's never complete. The critic Susan Sontag wrote that a complete set of something is not the completeness a collector craves. What she's saying is that the collector really wants to chase after completeness, never actually get there. Seen this way, the ever-evolving nature of our work is actually a thrilling aspect to canon creation, not an impediment to it. Critique is a very complex instrument. It disassembles the very things it wishes to knit together. If you've ever viewed source to see how a web page was built, you know exactly what I mean. If we viewed source on our collective efforts at making meaning in our work, how would this work be built? That's exactly what we should try to answer next. Thank you. <laughs>